Hello, everyone. Hi there. Welcome back to Book Club on Telescola. We are your hosts. I'm Mr. Daryl. And I am Miss Maka. So, Miss Maka, uh, we are going to talk about a short story today. Yes, by Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. The Oval Portrait. Mm -hmm. Now, this was published in 1842, uh, and it's actually one of his shortest stories at two pages long. Yeah, and the longer version, entitled Life in Death, had previously been published in Graham magazine. Mm -hmm. So it was popular in the magazine, and then it was good enough that he published it on its own. Uh, yeah, it was. So uh, now before we start the discussion of, uh, about the book, uh, let's look at the agenda. So uh, firstly, we will introduce the new vocabulary. After that, we will talk about the author as mentioned, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, later, we'll move on to the summary of the book. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to characters after that. Look at the setting of the story. Uh, it's another time, another place. And we'll bring out some main themes for the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, of course, uh, we will give you uh, homework. OK, let's move on to the vocabulary. We have quite a few words to talk about. Our first word, to depict depict, it's a verb, and it is to represent something as if by a painting or to portray something. Mm -hmm. Our next word is countenance. Countenance, it's a noun. Uh, this is the appearance of something, especially the look on someone's face. Our next word is a noun, ardor. Ardor. Um, this is a feeling of great warmth, uh, passion, fervor. Vneba, kzneba. Our next noun is perusal. Perusal. Uh, this is kind of a reading of something, going through something to read it. Kuradrebit, kuldasmit kitva. Our next noun is reverie. Uh, reverie. It's a nice, lovely word. Uh, a fantastic or visionary or uh, even impractical idea. Our next word is an adjective, withered, withered. The meaning of this is that it, uh, something, when something shrivels, fades away, decays, for example, a plant. Mm -hmm. Our next noun is agitation, agitation. This is a feeling of psychological or even physical restlessness often followed with activity like wringing your hands or you know doing some mm. activity mm -hmm. okay gelva spotva and our last word of today is incipient incipient it's an adjective this is when something is beginning to exist or appear uh, it's, it's something's at its initial stage well now we should move on to the author part yeah. i guess um, Edgar Allan Poe, as we've mentioned, is one of the most celebrated of all American authors, heavily influenced by the German roman romantic ironists. Uh, Poe made his um, mark in Gothic uh, fiction, especially through the title of the macabre for which he is now so famous. Mm -hmm. So he was born in uh, 1809. And both his parents died before he was even three. Prior to uh, enlisting in the army, he had a published book of poetry, Tamerlane and other poems. Tamerlane, by the way, came to Georgia, so it's that, it's that Tamerlane. Wow. Um, after his army time and while still a student at West Point, uh, he published a second volume, uh, which was favorably received. Mm, interesting. So, uh, physically weaker and uh, older than most of his classmates, um, Edgar somehow felt a bit out of place uh, and he mostly devoted much of his love and attention and time um, to studying the romantic um, poets. Mm -hmm. uh, he married Virginia Clem at the, um, after that. He became the editor of the magazine, The Messenger. And in 1837, he resigned from that magazine, The Messenger, which he had actually helped make very popular. 
Yeah, and uh, later he became the editor of the, um, like, associate editor of Barron's Gentleman magazine um, in Philadelphia. So, for which he wrote The Fall of the House of Usher. Mm -hmm. We've done that. We've done that already. Um, this year, uh, that year, sorry. And the uh, tragedy, however, was just around the corner. So, while gossip surrounded his, like, potentially um, adulterous relations with uh, uh, Francis, um, so like Virginia's health was rapidly decreasing that actually um, resulted in uh, the writer's um, like writing quality also and his bad habits. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually Virginia died in 1847 and this caused a deterioration of Poe's mental health. Um, he became violent, he had violent mood swings, uh, probably because of alcohol and drug abuse and his body and mind both kind of started to waste away. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually he really tried to uh, tried um, and had an attempt at uh, rehabilitation and he traveled to Richmond in uh, 1849 to uh, court a former friend um, and unfortunately so soon after their engagement um, Poe was found in a stupor um, a on a Baltimore street and was taken to a nearby hospital but unfortunately four days later on Sunday uh, October October the 7th, he died at the age of 40. Oh, so we could say very young. Very young. Another tragedy. Yep. So now let's move on yeah. to the summary of the book. Um, Pedro. So Pedro is the valet, uh, brings the inju injured narrator into his abandoned like house because he does not want him to have to sleep outside. Um, they decide to force entry, wishing only to stay the night in one of the um, smallest apartments. And th this apartment is the most important, most important and interesting part of the story. Yeah, the narrator begins to take an intense interest in the paintings and tells Pedro mm -hmm. uh, to close the windows, to light a candelabrum, which is a kind of thing that holds candles and to open the bed curtains. He wants to be able to see the paintings while reading the book that he found on the pillow. The book provides information about the paintings in the room. Mm -hmm. And now the narrator can see the picture of a girl that uh, he hadn't uh, noticed before. And this, this is a girl on the cusp of becoming a woman. The portrait of a girl's uh, head on the shoulders of um, Thomas Sully, an American artist. Mm -hmm. And more about the picture, the oval frame of this picture, oval is this kind of shape, is uh, covered in gold filigree, gold designs, in the Moorish style, or kind of uh, Oriental, um, Arab, North African style. For a moment, the narrator mistakes the painting for a living person. That's how high quality what the, the painting was. But obviously, it is a painting. He wonders how he could have thought the per painting was a person, and then decides to move the candle away from the painting so that he can't look at the painting anymore. Yeah, because maybe he cannot resist or he, he is very frightened because of the feeling that he thinks that the painting is real. Who knows? So the narrator begins to read about the portrait, uh, which says that the artist of the portrait was a passionate um, person who is very into his work and actually loves his work just like he loves his wife. And his wife naturally is happy and loves um, her husband, but she hates art because she sees um, and because art means um, he has less time for her. Mm -hmm. So she sees it as a kind of selfish activity? Uh, from the woman? Mm -hmm. No, I guess not. Le we will later see that it's not uh, her selfishness, but the artist's obsession. Mm -hmm. The painter asks his wife to sit as a model, which she's not excited about. She's modest and obedient, however, so she sits for it. Uh, he sits in a dark tower where the only light comes from a window above, and this painter does not realize that his wife is wasting away in the darkness, um, but she doesn't complain and she continues to smile. 
That's crazy. So um, the portrait is so lifelike that everyone who sees it actually is struck by it. Uh, they say it is a combination of his skill and his love to her. So maybe like kind of double love or something, is it correct to say? You could say that. Okay, so when he is nearly done, he actually decides to lock them both uh, on the upper part of the house and away from the visitors to put all his concentration in the, paint in the painting. And as he paints this picture, he doesn't realize his wife getting paler, losing this color in her skin, uh, and the painting becoming more lifelike. Uh, and then when he finally finishes this painting, he exclaims that the painting is life itself. He turns to his wife and he sees that she died at the moment he finished the last um, brush stroke on the painting. Very sad. Uh, very uh, macabre. Uh, mm -hmm. Macabre thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, have, let's ask the audience a question now. Uh, in general, what makes a painting uh, lifelike? Sometimes the colors make the painting very special. Uh, also, the story behind the painting might be the magic power. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, colors also have this effect. Yeah, it depends what technique the artist uses. Yeah, the, uh, the vibrancy or the um, attractiveness of the painting. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the characters. So who make the story even more interesting? So the very first character is uh, the the wounded man, the narrator of the story. He is not a developing character, as the author does not suggest his life changes in, a, in any way after the particular episode uh, presented in the story. Um, the most important characters of the story, um, we like this is the wounded man, the narrator, and then comes the painter and the young uh, woman in the portrait as secondary characters. Mm -hmm. Let's quickly talk about Pedro, the, 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 the valet of the wounded man. He's also mentioned. He's the only one with a name, uh, but contrary to thinking that maybe that makes him more important, it actually mm -hmm. makes him the least important character. So the other characters having no names have a kind of mystery about them. Mm -hmm. And this Pedro, uh, you're supposed to, you, you hear his name and you kind of dismiss him. Interesting. So the next character is the artist himself. So uh, as a renowned portrait painter known for the obsessive and moody passion um, he injects into the uh, work, into his work. And for the, the remarkable ability to create lifelike images of um, people. Uh, his passion for his art, however, um, s somehow eclipses the living, uh, breathing really on his wife, uh, yeah, over uh, whose portrait um, he labors day and night. Uh, but while working on the portrait, he actually misses out lots of things about uh, his wife. Mm -hmm. There's something v vampiric about this process as well. He's kind of, uh, he's not you know, actually taking blood from people, mm -hmm. but he is drawing the, the life energy from his wife. Mm -hmm. Yep. So he seems to regard his wife less as a fellow human being than an inspiration for his art. Uh, and his wife ultimately die, dies while he overlooks her uh, health to focus on the portrait. So Poe uses the character of the artist um, to dramatize his uh, critique of obsessive perfectionism. So we can see that he's trying to say that it's not always good to be that obsessed with your work. Mm -hmm. good, good, good lesson. Mm -hmm. We have another character, the young woman herself. The narrator becomes enchanted with the skilled painting of this young woman who is probably in her late teens. Uh, she becomes the object of the narrator's affection, even though she's dead. Uh, it's clear from his description that she is extremely beautiful. She's presented ex as extremely beautiful. Uh, she was married to the painter of the pro portrait and sat uncomplaining while he painted her portrait. Yeah, so interesting. I think she should have complained. <laughs> Might have saved her life. If, yeah, of course, if she knew the ending of her life, I think she would. Are you telling us that we should complain more? 
Uh, no, of course, but uh, definitely if you see that something is too much, you mm -hmm. should of course. at least say. Yeah. In that sense, you have to, you have to complain mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, of course. So now it is time to ask a question to our audience. So most of the characters in the story, they don't have names. So do you think this is a special technique of uh, Gothic style? Um, yes, I think this is done on purpose to uh, to create exposition and to let the readers even imagine everything themselves. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I guess unnamed characters, I think, create more mysticism in the story. Mm -hmm. But this is not an excuse uh, not to find out someone's name. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question uh, for characters and um, someone from our audience hopefully can answer this. Do you think it is normal to put all your energy into your work, just like the painter in this story does? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's not normal to be that obsessed with your work, but uh, maybe that's how the masterpieces are created. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there's lots of obsession in masterpieces. Uh, mm -hmm. you, have, you kind of have to be to create something that's worth uh, the attention of people. Yeah, and just now, I don't know, it mm, just came up to my mind, this Dorian Gray portrait as well. We have seen how uh, masterpieces can um, affect... Psychologically. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, similarity between this story and that story as well. Maybe. I maybe. wonder if he was influenced by this story. Mm, uh, I don't know. Uh, I have no information about this, but we can see lots of yeah. um, common characteristics between we, those. We who have studied both stories yes, now. Yes, exactly. The setting is what we should talk about next, I think. Mm -hmm. It's the 19th century, the mid-19th century, uh, when Poe was writing. It was a largely patriarchal era, um, and male-produced literature and art tended to underplay or even ignore uh, the women that were involved in it. And mm -hmm. that's exactly kind of what happens in the story. At first glance, uh, that's the, the old portrait. Yeah, and now let's move on to the where part of the story. So this short story, the setting for this short story is uh, an abandoned chateau uh, in a mountain range called the Apennines that runs the length of the central of Italy. And uh, because the chateau is so remote, uh, we can we can see that because that, that chateau is abandoned and in the mountains, uh, we can see say that it is so remote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the specific location is a turret. It's kind of a tower and um, in one of the rooms in this tower. And although for us, you, you might think of a tower as a kind of simple place, um, because it's a Gothic story, obviously Poe puts a lot of opulent and fantastic kind of uh, furniture in there. It has a tall candelabra. Uh, it, it has a bed with fringed black velvet hangings from, from the bed. So it's, it's, you know, it's obviously a Gothic location. Okay, now it is time to ask a question to our audience. So do you think the fact that the, uh, the most of the story happens in one room uh, might be boring for a reader? Um, no, I think it won't be because the room seems very interesting, full of paintings um, and the stories behind them and uh, different valuable decorations. Thank you very much. Um, I also agree with you. Mr. Daryl, would you stay in this type of room? No, why not? It, it seems picturesque, mm -hmm. um, fascinating in a way. Yeah, and a bit gothic. Uh, away from my normal sur surrounding. Yeah, kind of will be very diverse for us, yeah? Okay, so now it is time to move on and look at the um, main themes of the story. Uh, this is a life and uh, idealization. So um, although uh, Poe focuses the, mm, the, the backdrop of Gothic horror, uh, he explores life versus death uh, rather than good versus evil. He explores something that seems um, kind of banal on the surface, like um, 
something like is called inattentiveness. Um, even as the young woman was asked to pose for her husband, she hated only the art which was her rival, and uh, but um, like kind of sat meekly uh, for many weeks in the dark, high um, place where she would just stay still and say nothing. Uh, well, and, and the painter misses that she gets worse and worse as he paints her in this dark tower. And partially it's because the light is so mm -hmm. bad, he can't see anything. He's just focused on his activity of uh, painting her. Yeah, and the painter, uh, painter's in attentiveness to the young woman actually is reflected in the paintings being uh, in the painting being stunningly lifelike, which shows that the painter who made it uh, took great effort um, and great care to do so. However, the narrator uh, reads the story of how the painting um, came to be and is horrified to discover um, that the subject died while working on this piece of art. Mm -hmm. So Poe is making a point basically that life matters uh, more than art. Mm -hmm. um, he's also saying the great art can be all-consuming, uh, too consuming uh, and takes away your focus on the rest of life. Mm -hmm. It does. Our next topic that we have chosen for you is agency and objectification. So um, in the story, um, the male character um, characters are always uh, gazing upon and admiring the wife's beauty. But the wife is, herself is taken, uh, has very little agency or depth to her character, to her uh, personality maybe. Uh, she is characterized as an object uh, for men to admire and venerate, but not a full person uh, in her own right. So we would say that um, the, the male characters see women just as objects of beauty and in this case as an object of um, his work. So he's talking about the, the dangers of seeing something purely for the beauty uh, of it, as opposed mm -hmm. to maybe something else that's valuable inside. Yes, exactly. And uh, the same thing, the wife exists as an object uh, for the painter's contemplation. Uh, and her own agency and subjectivity are downplayed. So we could say that it is a um, minor um, not problem but issue for the husband so he prioritize uh, he prioritizes his work over uh, his wife mm -hmm. and another aspect uh, the husband and wife it's a husband and wife but the husband's um, far more dominant than the wife she's quiet mute and meek and mm -hmm. doesn't really complain against him uh, so there's the unequal, unequal balance there the social balance the husband is dominant the wife uh, just takes what's given to her Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, Mr. Darrell, maybe we have a question for the audience. Yes, um, we have a question for the audience. Do you think that creating a masterpiece is worth any human being's death? Uh, of course not, but I think that the painter from the uh, story uh, didn't know that uh, his uh, wife would die after by the end of uh, his job. So um, thank you very much. I think the the um, the student actually meant that maybe if he knew that his uh, wife uh, was going was to die, suffering, yeah, yeah, sh he would have stopped. But what do you think? Uh, yeah, and I think it is a it's a question of obsession. So if he's been so obsessed, he has stopped paying attention to vital things like if his wife is alive. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. That's not easy to to answer this question, but definitely I agree that, of course, no piece of art um, can be the reason of any human being's death. And here's the power of this author, Poe, um, from a two-page story, mm -hmm. or a very short story. We have this much uh, things to talk about, these many themes to think about, life versus death, unequalness in, in, a, in a relationship. That he could manage in two-page story, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Darrell, I guess we can wrap everything up now. And uh, firstly, we mentioned the author, um, Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. Then we looked at the summary. Uh, obviously, the story is about an unnamed narrator who uh, paints his, his wife literally to death. 
Yeah, and we didn't have many characters in the story, but the narrator, uh, the young artist, mm, the artist, and the young woman, his wife. Mm -hmm. And the setting, of course, of the 19th century, uh, the Apennines in Italy, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, central Italy. Yeah, and the main themes that uh, create lots of discussions. Um, this is life uh, versus art, and agency and objectification. Mm -hmm. Let me just review the words, uh, the vocabulary list from the beginning once more. To depict, countenance, ardor, per perusal, reverie, withered, agitation, and incipient. Thank you very much. And we have a homework question for our audience. Mm -hmm. Find a picture that is considered to be a masterpiece, describe it, and give reasons why you think it is considered a masterpiece. Yeah. Modzebnet surati, romelits shedevrad miichneva, da achtzeret, da sabutet tu radom itleba igi shedevrad. Very good. And they should send that, those answers to the address you see on the screen right now. Pasukhebi shegizlet gamuakzavnot ekranze mititebul misamartze. Well, Ms. Maka, have you uh, tried your hand at any artistic activity before? Oh, yes, I'm great at copying. Copying? Yes. <laughs> artistic. Actually, this is also one of uh, the skills that you might have, but I cannot really create anything myself, I think. I mean, the, the, the art, piece of art or something. Can you be an artist in copying? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> okay, I guess that's all for today. It was really interesting to discuss um, those very, how to say, serious topics with you. Thank you very much. Same for the, uh, the audience that watches us on, on TV. Mm -hmm. We're very appreciative of their interest and uh, efforts with homework. Mm -hmm. So now it is time to say goodbye to you. Have a nice week. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>